When a person stays in power for too long, they can go mad. This sensible thought was once expressed by the president of Russia, Putin, before his second term election. Since then, he has been re-elected three more times and is now preparing for the fourth. Following his logic, he should have gone mad a long time ago. In that case, it explains many of his actions. On October 7th, said dictator celebrates his birthday. He has been in power for a staggering 23 years. An entire generation of Russians has been born and raised without even considering the possibility of someone else leading their country. The tremendous propaganda machine of Russia tirelessly fuels this delusion. One might think that his life is an open book, thoroughly examined over the years. However, that is not the case. During decades of authoritarian rule, many inconvenient facts from Putin's life have been concealed and his official biography has been rewritten multiple times. Eventually, it became nearly shorted in secrecy. Discussing or even mentioning this in Russia is off-limits. Today, we will acquaint you with the intriguing and therefore thoroughly hidden facts from Putin's biography. Watch this! At the end of January 2000, the annual Global Economic Summit was underway in the Swiss town of Davos. Russia itself was one of the hot topics on the agenda, since at the time the baton of power in the country was passing from hand to hand. Boris Yeltsin appointed former KGB agent Vladimir Putin as his successor, who started active preparations for his first presidential confrontation. Who is Mr. Putin? asked the Russian delegation. The audience fell into silence and then burst into laughter. Although there was no reason for this, the whole nation was being handed over to a man who was practically a mystery within Russia and on the world stage. This began a massive immersion into the background of the new ruler. In March 2000, a book titled From the Horse's Mouth hit the shelves with the help of experienced hackers just before Putin's first triumphed ascensions to the presidency. It served as Putin's official biography for a while and was posted all over the president's official website and liberally quoted by fellow scribes. But nowadays, that biography is about as easy to find as a needle in a haystack. It spilled far too many personal info, including Ludmila Putina's quotes, about her now ex-husband, and various tidbits about the president's two daughters. For instance, Ludmila recalled their first meeting. He was dressed rather humbly, some might even say shabbily. He was so inconspicuous that I wouldn't have given him a second glance on the street. Labeling the president of Russia as inconspicuous? By Russian standards, this is not exactly the word that should be used to describe a leader, even if this is just the impression of his better half. While from the horse's mouth was taken numerous ovations, another enterprising scribbler decided to dig deep into the new president's life story. A retired officer and military journal named Oleg Bloksky initially played detective, piecing together nuggets of information on his own. Eventually, he managed to organize a face-to-face -face meeting with the Putin clan. The one stipulation was to keep mum about the offspring. The first book made waves pretty swiftly, but this one was navigating some treacherous waters despite its overall rosy tone. These days, you'd need to be a collector with deep pockets to get your hands on Blocksky's books. Digital editions are as rare as hen's teeth. Whereas sticking point? In the book, Putin was portrayed as your average Joe guy. A big surprise for readers was a bunch of amusing stories about her husband told by Ludmila Putina. She spilled the beans about how he had a habit of turning up fashionably late to their dates, having her twiddling her thumbs, or how for the longest time she had no clue that her other half was once a card carrying KGB agent or the rather old-fashioned views Putin had when it came to his wife's duties. A woman should run the whole show at home. 
All of this showed the president in an unflattering light. Moreover, the books flattered a rather intriguing troupe of photographs. Thanks to these snaps, one could identify Putin's former comrades in arms, mates and relatives. Many of them today are linked to a whole host assets. As the new autocrat continued his reign, there was a concerted effort to conceal any elements from his life story that portrayed him as a mediocre guy. He wanted to perceive as some kind of deity. What was special in the life of Guy, who became the head of the world's largest nation? Watch this! The future dictator was born in Leningrad, into a family of semi-literate peasants. His father was a World War II veteran who later worked in a factory, while his mother, surviving the Leningrad blockade took on various jobs as a nurse, cleaner and guard. According to the editor of the Putinism website, which delves into unknown facts about the president's life, his father was a harsh individual with deviant tendencies. They said he once gouged out his future wife's eye with a fork. The family lived in a single room in a communal apartment and struggled financially. For instance, Putin Jr. didn't get his first coat until he was 20. In one of his early interviews, Putin confessed that his parents didn't really play a role in his upbringing. He claimed the streets raised him, following their cruel rules and wolfish laws. After school, Vladimir attended the law faculty of Leningrad University. According to some researchers of his biography, Putin, who had a mediocre school record, was accepted in the university as a promising judo athlete. During his studies, he focused more on training and competition than academics. On his fourth year at the university, Putin was recruited and, upon graduation, was sent to work for the Committee for State Security KGB. After a decade of unremarkable routine work, luck allegedly smiled upon him. In 1985, Putin was assigned to work abroad, a dream for any Soviet citizen. His family relocated to Dresden, East Germany. At the time, the German Democratic Republic was a crucial outpost for Moscow on the borders of Western Europe. It was flooded with Soviet troops and spies. What did Putin do in Germany? Officially, he worked at the House of Soviet-German Friendship. But in effect, he has engaged in surveillance over so-Soviet students and carried out minor assignments. Additionally, towards the end of the 1980s, he may have been involved in deals related to the sale of party and military assets. There were no exciting Bond-like espionage adventures. Dresden was on the periphery of the KGB operations, and no significant events happened in the city. That's why it's funny to hear people trying to portray Putin as some sort of Soviet James Bond. None of that happened. He was just an ordinary intelligence officer, one among thousands at the time. Putin's code name during his time at the KGB was Mole. Indeed, inconspicuous Grey Mole. Watch this. In East Germany, he understood how society worked and realized the value of building strong personal connections and wealth. The standard of living there was leagues ahead of the Soviet Union. Colleagues of Putin recall how he could spend hours flipping through Western clothing catalogs just to keep up with fashion trends, and his wife would often remark how they envied the locals. East Germany differed from the Soviet Union in its political structure. Despite having the communists in power, there were other parties, even though their role was mostly ornamental. Putin took note of this political model and would go on to implement it when he became president. Dresden played host to events that had a profound impact on Putin's character and future life. In October 1989, protests erupted in East Germany. The Berlin Wall came crashing down along with the communist regime. Stasi offices, the East German equivalent of the KGB, were being stormed across the country. 
Putin himself has talked extensively about this period in various interviews. According to reports, protesters besieged the villa where Soviet intelligence officers had stationed. He spent hours burning secret documents, and when crowd gathered to storm the building, he single-handedly stopped them. Many years later, official propaganda in Russia began to spread the myth of Putin's heroics in Dresden. The accuracy of this story raises many questions. While there were indeed large-scale protests on that day, they all took place near the Stasi building, not the KGB. According to eyewitnesses of those events, there were no demonstrations near Villa of Soviet intelligence officers. During the revolution, Germans did not lay a finger on the Russian or Soviet property. Nevertheless, those events left an indelible mark on Putin. The uprising of the people, the chaos in the city, the ranks Stasi building and Soviet tanks waiting for orders from Moscow to quell the protests – all of this shaped his views on Mikhail Gorbachev indeed. From the perspective of a Czechist like Putin, Gorbachev's actions were seen as weakness and betrayal. Putin probably would not have hesitated to use force. Two weeks later, Putin suffered another psychological blow. Helmut Kohl, the leader of West Germany, visited Dresden. During a rally, he declared the inevitability of the country's reunification and praised Gorbachev for refusing to send tanks. The KGB's mission in the country was over, and Putin and his family headed back home. They took with them a second-hand washing machine gifted by their German friends. Putin definitely was reflecting on what happens when power shifts to the masses. Among experts, there is a belief that the Kyiv Maiden reminded Putin of the events in East Germany. When Ukrainians took to the streets in 2004 and 2013 to defend their rights and freedoms, he likely recalled his service, and all his old fears came flooding back. Later, tours of Putin's Dresden even started popping up, though local tour guides note that they are not particularly popular. Watch this. After his stint in East Germany, Putin returned to a country that had undergone significant changes under Gorbachev and was teetering on the brink of disaster. What to do next? How to make a living? But soon enough, he realized that he had managed to smuggle out of Germany something far more valuable than an old washing machine. In Dresden, he had made acquaintances with people who may have lost their previous social roles, but were now in a position to pursue political careers in the new Russia. Some of his German familiars eventually became part of his inner circle. For instance, Sergei Chemezov, who served as head honcho of the state corporation Rostec for many years, or Nikolai Tokarev, who controls the world's largest oil pipeline company, named Transneft. Upon returning to Russia in January 1990, Putin remained a career officer in the KGB. In May, he became an advisor to Anatoly Sobchak. At the time, Sobchak was the most popular politician in Leningrad. By the way, thanks to his efforts, Leningrad was renamed St. Petersburg. When he became the mayor, he managed to create a kind of state within a state. One of his first orders of business was to establish the Committee for External Relations under the mayor's office, appointing Putin as its chairman. So what was our hero up to in this new role? These years of his life were full of secrets, but at the same time they perfectly revealed him as a person. First, let's restore the time frame. It was the early 1990s, later called the Wild Years, as the country was in dire economic straits. People had not received their salaries for months, store shelves were practically empty, and the food rationing was in effect. At the turn of 1991 to 1992, St. Petersburg was on the brink of famine. During these challenging times, an idea emerged to combat food shortages through butter. Putin's committee was directly involved in this effort. They would export petroleum products, rare metals and other raw materials in exchange for foodstuffs. 
However, the promised meat, potatoes and poultry never arrived in the northern capital. A scandal erupted leading to the creation of a group to investigate Putin's committee's activities. Its leader, local deputy Marina Selye, claimed that food supply contracts were signed with shell companies. Putin was accused of setting dumping prices and issuing licenses for the delivery of petroleum products to a firm led by a twice convicted criminal. According to Marina Salier, Vladimir Putin's team had embezzled more than $100 million, cashing a total damage of $850 million to the state. Putin vehemently denied all accusations and believed that the scandal was an attempt to exploit his KGB past and exert pressure on Sobchak. Sully's commission handed the report to the Presidential Control Directorate of Russia, but the investigation stalled and never went to trial. Dmitry Medvedev, Putin's assistant at the time, played a significant role in deciphering the cause and shielding Putin from harm. Despite the fact that Leningrad City Council agreed with the commission's findings and recommended Putin's dismissal, Sobchak not only refrained from doing so, but also promoted his protégé, making him the first deputy mayor. Watch this! The 1990s in Russia were not just a time of major economic hardships and political strife. It was the heyday of crime and organized criminal activities. St. Petersburg, rightly called the Northern Capital, was also considered the criminal capital of Russia. The country was divided into spheres of influence among powerful criminal groups, who, in addition to everything else, were fighting among themselves. The most influential gang in St. Petersburg was the notorious Tambov criminal syndicate, led by Vladimir Kumarin, who became a legend in the criminal world of Russia. After Putin's victory in the elections, a series of publications in the Western press suggested a connection between Kumarin's group and Putin. Following Putin's rise to power, one of the most influential figures in the business and political life of St. Petersburg became Roman Tsepov. He provided security for Sobchak and the future president in the early 1990s, and according to the well-known journalist Alexander Nevzorov, he was an employee of the Ministry of Internal Affairs MVD. Infiltrated into the criminal world, Tsepov provided security services to several criminal authorities, including the Tambov Group. In 2004, he unexpectedly died from poisoning. His symptoms were eerily similar to Alexander Litvinenko's polonium poisoning. The cream of the criminal world attended Tsepov's funeral. Even the top Putin bodyguard, who later headed the National Guard, Viktor Zolotov, was present. This photo was attached to the materials of the Litvinenko case as evidence of Putin's ties to the Mafia. In the 1990s, intelligence agencies from various countries discovered that major cocaine smuggling roads into Europe were operating through Russia. However, there was no concrete evidence until 1993, when a container of Colombian canned meat was seized near Leningrad. Over a ton of cocaine was hidden inside the cans. Amazingly, the story was soon forgotten. The organizers of the scheme went unpunished. Furthermore, they later established several companies in St. Petersburg, including some in partnership with the Committee for External Relations of the Mayor's Office, headed by Putin. Coincidence? Moreover, according to the rules, the confiscate cocaine was supposed to be destroyed. Instead, it ended up in FSB warehouse and remained there for two years before disappearing. It's no wonder that the term stripped roof was coined in St. Petersburg in the 1990s. It referred to joint organized criminal groups composed of criminals, police officers and security service agents. And it's hardly surprising that this happened when Putin was the second most powerful figure in the city. By the end of Yeltsin's rule, two of the world's largest organized criminal groups had emerged in Russia, the Podolsk-Ismailova and Sonsiva groups. 
both had immense resources and patterns within the security services. As Putin ascended to the presidency, he had to strike deals with them, and both groups have thrived throughout his entire tenure. For example, the Podolsk group became notorious for orchestrating the global-scale laundromat fraud. It was the largest money laundering scheme in world history, involving the embezzlement and laundering of around $50 billion from Russia. Watch this. And the life paths of Putin and Sobchak diverged. In 1996, Sobchak lost gubernatorial elections to his deputy Vladimir Yakovlev and fell into disgrace. He faced criminal charges of bribery and abuse of power, leading him to flee the country for several years. Meanwhile, Vladimir Putin's federal career in Moscow was taking off. In August 1996, he was appointed the deputy chief of presidential affairs under Yeltsin. In July 1998, he took over the Federal Security Service, the successor to the Soviet KGB. Just a year later, President Boris Yeltsin decided to make Putin his successor and appointed him as the prime minister. According to many analysts, Yeltsin's choice to Putin was not a coincidence. It was in exchange for guarantees of his family's immunity. But there was a problem. Nobody in Russia knew who Putin was. And there was no certainty that they could elevate him to a popular federal-level politician capable of winning elections in a limited time. At the time, Russia still held relatively free elections. Tragic events, however, played into Putin's hands. Explosions in residential buildings across Russia in September 1999, such as Moscow, Bunaksk and Volgodonsk. This series of terrorist acts claimed the lives of over 300 people, and another 1,700 were injured to varying degrees. There was no credible public investigation. According to some independent researchers, the FSB carried out these terrorist acts under Vladimir Putin's personal guidance. They said that these explosions allowed Putin to boost his ratings as an uncompromising fighter against terrorism and consequently to win the 2000 presidential elections. The events in Rezan only seemed to confirm this version. Explosives disguised as sugar sacks, identical to those planted in other cities during the bombings, were found in the basement of a residential building. After this, FSB director Nikolai Patrushev claimed that it was just a security exercise, confirming that representatives of his agency had placed the sacks. Since then, the term Razan Sugar has become a meme. For the first time, the detailed description of this version appeared in the FSB Blows Up Russia book, authored by historian Yuri Filshtinsky and former FSB officer Alexander Litvinenko. Later, Litvinenko was poisoned with a radioactive polonium in the heart of Britain. A similar fate befell those who supported this version or conducted independent investigations. For instance, State Duma deputies Sergei Yushenkov and Yuri Shekachikhin and journalist Anna Politkovskaya. How can we not recall the words of American senator and 2016 US presidential candidate Mark Rubio? Let's quote his exact words. Russia's leader is a gangster. He's basically an organized crime figure who controls the government and a large territory. Watch this. When Putin took office in 2000, he brought along his former subordinates and colleagues from the St. Petersburg mayor's office. Dozens of residents of St. Petersburg relocated to Moscow, occupying important positions in the government. Let's mention just a few of the most well-known names. Dmitry Medvedev, the head of the Russian government and the man Putin allowed to serve one term as president to comply with the constitution. The others were Nikolai Patrushev, Viktor Zolotov, Alexander Bortnikov, Sergei Ivanov, Alexei Kudrin, Herman Kriv, and Vladimir Yakunin. Back in 1996, Putin and his friends established the Ozero Dacha Cooperative. No wonder that, after Putin's elections as president, these friends took on leading positions in the country. 
Of course, Putin's rapid rise couldn't help but impress his former colleagues, including Anatoly Sobchak, who could now count on the protection of his former subordinate. He returned to Russia, and the case against him was dropped. But his time in his homeland would be short-lived. Even before the presidential elections in February 2000, Sobchak suddenly passed away, officially due to heart failure. However, many at the time questioned the validity of this explanation. Rumors of his murder spread, as Sobchak knew too much about the future president. And as we recall, there were many disappearances as well as sudden and mysterious death around Putin. For instance, in 1998, after he became the head of the FSB, an article titled Lieutenant Colony Putin Illegally Heads the FSB was published in the newspaper Yurdichiski Peterburg. In fact, this article was his first extensive biography in print at the time. A week later, journalist Anatoly Levin Utkin, who had participated in writing the article, was brutally beaten and died in hospital, and the newspaper was shut down. Perhaps this was the first case of shutting down media for writing about Putin. Several years would pass before the crackdown on independent media began in earnest. It then became standard practice in Russia. It is forbidden to write or talk about the president. The newspaper Moskovsky Correspondent was closed immediately after publishing an article about Putin's wedding to gymnast Alina Kabaeva. Today, only specially approved journalists are allowed to write or talk about the Russian leader, although this can hardly be called journalism. And what's truly amusing is this. For decades, Soviet propaganda aimed at the younger generation referred to the founder of the Soviet state as Grandfather Lenin. This was despite Lenin passing away at the young age of 53. Yet today, they are doing their utmost to depict the aging dictator who looks undoubtedly frail, as a young and vigorous man in the prime of his life. However, with each passing day, this task became increasingly unachievable. Watch this! So, the dictator is 71 today. A great age to take stock of his destructive legacy. With the windfall profits from the oil and gas sector during Putin's 23-year rule, Russia could have transformed into a successful, prosperous nation, a global showcase. But for that to happen, political reforms were needed to democratize the system. Today, Russia is an authoritarian regime hurtling toward full-blown dictatorship. The population is impoverished, while close to the regime oligarchs amass vast wealth. Cultural and societal stagnation reigns, as well as prohibition on what is not yet prohibited, prosecution of dissenting voices, and hunt for both external and internal enemies. They unleashed war in Ukraine, where hundreds of thousands of Russian soldiers have already perished. However, despite all of this, there is fear in them, an all-encompassing fear of inevitable reckoning. In the early days of his rule, the world had high hopes for Russia. It was a welcome guest on major political stages, a member of the J8, and Putin himself hinted at NATO membership. In 2001, US President George W. Bush famously said he had looked into Putin's soul and found him trustworthy. Later, he regretted his word. And in 2008, Hillary Clinton, as Bush was leaving politics, I would like to remind you that Putin was a KGB agent. By definition, he doesn't have a soul. There is some truth to that, but not the whole truth. It wasn't the KGB or the criminal underworld of 90 St. Petersburg that made Putin a ruthless tyrant. They only exacerbated what was instilled in him during his childhood when the law of jungle prevailed on the St. Petersburg backstreets. There is no other way for Putin and his team than to stay in power till the end. What this end will look like is impossible to predict. But one way or another, the fate of most dictators is bleak. Whether it's death at a dasha without medical aid under the watchful eyes of former associates, a vigilant judgment by an enraged mob, 
or a quiet demise in the prison cell of The Hague.